Purgatory, Part 2, Chapter 1 Fear and Confidence, The Mercy of God We have just considered the rigors of divine justice in the other life. They are terrific, and it is impossible to think of them without trembling. That fire, enkindled by divine justice, whose excruciating pains, compared with all the penances of the saints, all the sufferings of the martyrs put together, are as nothing. Who is there that thinks that he will be able to look upon them and not shudder from very fear? This fear is solitary and conformable to the Spirit of Jesus Christ. Our Divine Master desires that we should fear, and that we should fear not only hell, but also purgatory, which is a sort of mitigated hell. It is to inspire us with the holy fear that he shows us the dungeons of the supreme judge, whence we shall not depart until we have paid the last farthing. We may say of the fire of purgatory, that which is said of hell fire, Fear ye not them that kill the body, and are not able to kill the soul, but rather fear him that can cast both soul and body into hell. Matthew 10.28 Yet it is not the intention of our Lord that we should have an excessive and barren fear, a fear which tortures and discourages, a gloomy fear without confidence. No, he wishes that our fear should be tempered with great trust in his mercy. He desires that we should fear evil in order to prevent and avoid it. He desires that the thought of those avenging flames should stimulate us to a fervor in his service and cause us to expiate our faults in this world rather than in the other. Better is it to purge away our sins and cut off our vices now, says the author of the imitation, than to keep them for purgation hereafter. Moreover, if notwithstanding our endeavors to live well, and to satisfy for our sins in this world, we have well-grounded fears that we shall have to go undergo a purgatory. We must look forward to that contingency with unbounded confidence in God, who never fails to console those whom he has purified by sufferings. Now, to give our fear this practical character, this counterpoise of confidence, after having contemplated purgatory and all the rigor of its pains, we must consider it under another aspect from a different point of view, that of the mercy of God, which shines forth therein no less than his justice. If God reserves terrible chastisements in the other life for the least faults, he does not inflict them without, at the same time, tempering them with clemency and nothing showing better the admirable harmony of the divine perfection than purgatory, because the most severe justice is there exercised, together with the most ineffable mercy. If our Lord chastises those souls that are dear to him, it is in his love, according to the words, Such as I love, I rebuke and chastise. With one hand he strikes, with the other he heals. He offers mercy and redemption and abundance. Psalm 129 The infinite mercy of our Heavenly Father must be the firm foundation of our confidence, and after the example of the saints, we must keep it always before our eyes. The saints never lost sight of it, and it was for this reason that the fear of purgatory never deprived them of their peace and joy of the Holy Ghost. St. Ledwina, who so well knew the frightful severity of expiatory suffering, was animated with the spirit of confidence and endeavored to inspire others with the same. One time she received a visit from a pious priest while he was seated at her bedside. Together with the other virtuous persons, the conversation turned on the sufferings of the other life. Seeing in the hands of a woman a vase filled with grains of mustard seed, the priest took occasion to remark that he trembled when thinking of the fire of purgatory. Nevertheless, he added, I should be satisfied to go there for as many years as there are grains of seeds in this vase. 
then at least I should be certain of my salvation. What do you say, Father? replied the saint. Why so little confidence in the mercy of God? Ah, uh, if he had better knowledge of what purgatory is, or what frightful torments are there endured. Let purgatory be what it may, he replied. It persists in what I say. Some time after, this priest died, and the same persons who had been present during this conversation with St. Ledwina, questioning the saint to this condition of the other world, she replied, The deceased is well off on account of his virtuous life, but it would be better for him if he had more confidence in the passion of Jesus Christ, and if he had taken a milder view of the subject of purgatory. And what consists those lack of confidence which met the disapproval of our saint? In the opinion which the good priest had, that it is almost impossible to be saved, and that we shall enter heaven only after having undergone innumerable years of torture. This idea is erroneous and contrary to the Christian confidence. Our Savior came to bring peace to men of good will and to oppose upon them, as a condition of our salvation, a yoke which is sweet and a burden which is not heavy. Therefore, let your will be good, and you will find peace. You will see all difficulties and terrors vanish. Good will, that is everything. Be of good will, submit to the will of God, place his holy law above all else, serve the Lord with all your heart, and he will give you such powerful assistance that you will enter paradise with an astonishing felicity. I could never have believed, you will say, that it is so easy to enter heaven. Again, I repeat, to effect in us the wonder of mercy, God asks on our part an upright heart, a good will. Good will consists, properly speaking, in submitting and conforming our will to that of God, who is the rule of all good will, and this good will attains its highest perfection when we embrace the divine will as the sovereign good. Even then, when it opposed the greatest sacrifices, the most acute sufferings. O oh, admirable state, the soul thus disposed seems to lose the sensation of pain, and thus becomes the soul animated with the spirit of love. And, as St. Augustine says, when we love, we suffer not, or, if we suffer, we love the suffering. Venerable Claude de la Cambriere of the Society of Jesus possessed this loving heart, and in his retreat spirituality, he thus expresses his sentiments. We must not cease to expiate the past disorders of our life by penance, but it must be done without anxiety, because worse than that can befall us. When our will is good and we are submissive and obedient, is to be sent for a long time to purgatory, and we may say with good reason that this is a great evil. I do not fear purgatory. Of hell I will not speak, for I should wrong the mercy of God by having the least fear of hell, although I have merited it more than all the demons together. Purgatory I do not fear. I wish I had not deserved it, since I could not to do so without displeasing God. But, as I have merited to go there, I am delighted to go and satisfy his justice in the most rigorous manner it is possible to imagine, and that even to the day of judgment. I know that the torments there endured are horrible, but I know there they honor God, and cannot prove an injury to the souls, that there we are certain never to oppose the will of God, that we shall never resent his severity, that we shall love the rigors of his justice and await with patience until all be entirely appeased. Therefore I have given with my whole heart all my satisfactions for the souls in purgatory, and even bequeathed to others all the suffrages which shall be offered for me after my death, in order that God may be glorified in paradise by souls who have merited to be raised to a higher degree of glory than myself. 
Behold to what excess of charity the love of God and our neighbor transports us when it has once taken a possession of the heart. It transforms, transfigures, suffering in such a manner that all its bitterness is changed into sweetness. When thou shalt arrive thus far, the tribulation shall be sweet to thee, and thus shall relish it for the love of Christ. Then think that it is well with thee, for thou hast found a paradise upon earth. Imitation of Christ Let us therefore have great love for God, great charity, and we shall have little fear of purgatory. The Holy Ghost bears testimony in the depths of our heart that, being children of God, we have no need to dread the chastisements of a father. Purgatory, Part 2, Chapter 2 Confidence, Mercy of God Towards Souls It is true that all have not attained this high degree of charity, but there is no one that cannot have confidence in the divine mercy. This mercy is infinite. It imparts peace to all souls that keep it constantly before their eyes and confide therein. Now the mercy of God is exercised with regard to purgatory in a threefold manner. First, in consoling the souls. Second, in mitigating their sufferings. Third, in giving to ourselves a thousand means of avoiding those penal fires. In the first place, God consoles the souls in purgatory. He himself consoles them. He also consoles them through the Blessed Virgin and through the Holy Angels. He consoles the souls inspiring them by a high degree of faith, hope, and divine love, virtues which produce in them conformity to the divine will, resignation, and the most perfect patience. God, says St. Catherine of Genoa, inspires the souls in purgatory with so ardent a movement of devoted love that it would be sufficient to annihilate her were she not immortal. Illumined and inflamed by that pure charity, the more she loves God, the more she detests the least stain that displeases him, the least hindrance that prevents her union with him. Thus, if she could find another purgatory more terrible than the one that she is condemned, that soul would plunge herself therein, impelled by the impetuosity of the love which exists between God and herself in order that she might be sooner delivered from all that separates her from the sovereign God. These souls, says again the same saint, are intimately united to the will of God, and so completely transformed into it that they are always satisfied with its holy ordinances. The souls in purgatory have no choice of their own. They can no longer will anything than what God wills. They receive with perfect submission all that God gives them, and neither pleasure, nor contentment, nor pain can ever again make them think of themselves. St. Magdalene de Pazzi, after the death of one of her brothers, having gone to the choir to offer prayers for him, saw his soul a prey to intense sufferings. Touched with compassion, she melted into tears and cried out in a piteous voice, Brother, miserable and blessed at the same time, O soul afflicted and yet contented, these pains are intolerable and yet they are endured. Why are they not understood by those here below who have not the courage to carry their cross? Whilst you are in this world, my dear brother, you would not listen to my voice, and now you desire ardently that I should hear you. O God, equally just and merciful, Comfort this brother who has served you from his infancy. Have regard to your clemency, I beseech you, and make use of your great mercy in his behalf. O God, most just, if he has not always been attentive to please you, at least he has not despised those who make profession of serving you with fidelity. The day on which she has that wonderful ecstasy, during which she visited the different prisons in purgatory, seeing again that soul of her brother, she said to him, Poor soul, how you suffer, and nevertheless you rejoice. You burn and you are satisfied, because you know well 
that these sufferings must lead you to a great and unspeakable felicity. How happy shall I be, should I never have to endure a greater suffering? Remain here, my dear brother, and complete your purification in peace.